Book Two, composed among the Quadi on the River Gran. Begin the morning by saying to yourself, "I shall meet with people who are busybodies, ungrateful, arrogant, deceitful, envious, selfish. All these things trouble them by reason of their ignorance of what is good and evil. But I have seen that the nature of the good is that it is beautiful, and of the bad that it is ugly." And that the nature of him who does wrong is akin to my own nature, not in the sense of being of the same blood or seed, but in that it participates in the same intelligence and the same portion of the divinity. So I cannot be injured by any of them, for no one can fix on me what is ugly, nor can I be angry with my kinsman nor hate him. For we are born for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of the upper and lower teeth. To act against one another then is contrary to nature, and getting vexed with or turning away from someone is to act against them. Whatever it is that I am is a little flesh and breath and the sovereign mind. Throw away your books, no longer distract yourself, but think like this. As if you were now dying, despise the flesh. It is blood and bones and a network, a contexture of nerves, veins and arteries. See the breath also. What kind of a thing it is, air and not always the same, but every moment sent out and again sucked in. As for the sovereign mind, consider thus: you are an old man. No longer let this be a slave, a puppet, pulled this way and that by selfish impulses. No longer be dissatisfied with your present situation, or shrink from the future. All that is from the gods is full of providence. That which is from fortune is not separate from nature, or without an interweaving and involution with the things that are ordered by providence. From thence all things flow. And there is besides necessity, and that which is for the advantage of the whole universe of which you are a part. Now that is good for every part of nature which the nature of the whole brings, and that which serves to maintain this nature. And the universe is preserved by change, by the changes of the elements themselves, as by the changes of things compounded of the elements. Let these principles be enough for you. Let them always be fixed opinions, and let go of the thirst after books, that you may not die complaining, but cheerfully, truly, and from your heart thankful to the gods. Remember how long you have been putting off these things, and how often the gods have put opportunity in your way, and yet you do not use it. You must now, at last, take cognizance of the universe of which you are a part, and the administrator of the universe of which your existence is a manifestation, and that a limit of time is fixed for you, which, if you do not use for clearing away the clouds from your mind, it will go, and you will go, and the opportunity will never return. Every moment, think steadily as a Roman and a man to do what you have in hand with perfect and simple dignity, and affectionate feeling, and freedom from passion and justice, and to give your mind relief from all other thoughts. And you will give your mind relief if you perform every action of your life as if it were the last, laying aside all carelessness and passionate aversion from the commands of reason. And all hypocrisy and self-love, and discontent with a portion which has been given to you. You see how few things a man needs to lay hold of in order to be able to live a life that flows in quiet, and is like the existence of the gods. For the gods, on their part, will require nothing more from him who observes these things. Do wrong to yourself. You do wrong to yourself, my soul. And you will no longer have the opportunity of giving yourself respect. Every one's life is but a moment, but though yours is nearly finished, your soul does not reverence itself, but places your felicity on the souls of others. Do external things that fall upon your attention distract you? 
Give yourself time to learn something new and good, and cease to be whirled around by them. But then you must also avoid being carried about the other way, for those too are triflers who have wearied themselves in life by their activity, and yet have no goal to which to direct every movement of the mind, in a word, all their thoughts. Through not observing what is in the mind of another, a man has seldom been seen to be unhappy. But those who do not observe the movements of their own minds must of necessity be unhappy. This you must always bear in mind. What is the nature of the whole, and what is my nature, and how this is related to that, and what kind of a part it is of what kind of a whole, and that there is no one who hinders you from always doing and saying things that accord with the nature of which you are a part. Theophrastus, in his comparison of evil actions, such a comparison as one would make in accordance with the common notions of mankind, says like a true philosopher, that the offences that are committed through desire are more blamable than those that are committed through anger. For he who is excited by anger seems to turn away from reason with a certain pain and unconscious contraction. But he who offends through desire, being overpowered by pleasure, seems to be in a manner more intemperate and less manly in his offences. Rightly, then, and in a way worthy of philosophy, he said that the offence which is committed with pleasure is more blamable than that which is committed with pain, and on the whole the one is more like a person who has been initially wronged and is compelled to be angry through pain, but the other is moved by his own impulse to do wrong being carried towards doing something by desire. Since it is possible that you may depart from life this very moment, regulate every act and thought accordingly. But to go away from among men, if there are gods, is not a thing to be afraid of, for the gods will not involve you in evil. But if indeed they do not exist, or if they have no concern about human affairs, what is it to me to live in a universe devoid of gods or devoid of providence? But in truth they do exist, and they do care for human things, and they have put all the means in man's power to enable him not to fall into real evils. And as to the rest, if there was anything evil, they would have provided for this also, that it should be altogether in a man's power not to fall into it. Now that which does not make a man worse— how can it make a man's life worse? But neither through ignorance, nor having the knowledge but not the power to guard against or correct these things, can it be possible that the nature of the universe has overlooked them? Nor is it possible that it has made so great a mistake, either through want of power or want of skill, that good and evil should happen indiscriminately to the good and the bad. Certainly, death and life, honour and dishonour, pain and pleasure, all these things equally happen to good men and bad. But they are not things that make us either better or worse. Therefore, they are neither good nor evil. How quickly all things disappear, our bodies themselves into the universe, and into time the remembrance of them. What is the nature of all sense objects, and particularly those that enthrall with the bait of pleasure or terrify by pain, or are noised abroad on the empty vapour of fame. How worthless and contemptible and sordid and perishable and dead they are! All this it is the part of the intellectual faculty to observe. And to observe further, who are they whose opinions and voices accord reputation? What is death? And the fact that if a man looks at death in itself, and by the abstractive power of reflection separates out all the things that gather around it in the imagination, he will then consider it to be nothing else than an operation of nature. And if anyone is afraid of an operation of nature, he is a child. And this is not only an operation of nature, but is also a thing that conduces to nature's purposes. 
to observe too how does man come near to the deity, and by what part of him, and when this part of man is so disposed. Nothing is more wretched than a man who runs circles round everything, and as the poet Pindar says, pries into the things beneath the earth, and seeks by conjecture what is in the minds of his neighbours, without perceiving that it is enough to attend to the guardian spirit within him, and to reverence it sincerely. And reverence of the guardian spirit consists in keeping it pure from passion and thoughtlessness, and dissatisfaction with what comes from gods and men. For the things from the gods merit veneration for their excellence, and the things from men should be dear to us by reason of kinship, though sometimes in a way they also move our pity by reason of men's ignorance of good and bad, this defect being not less than that which deprives us of the power of distinguishing black from white. Though you should be going to live three thousand years, and as many times ten thousand years, still remember that no man loses any other life than this which he now lives, nor lives any other than this which he now loses. The longest life and the shortest are thus brought to the same condition, for the present is the same to all, and that which perishes is also the same, and so that which is lost is but a mere moment. For a man cannot lose either the past or the future, for how can any one take from a man what he does not have? These two things, then, you must bear in mind, the one that all things from eternity are of like forms and come round in a circle, and that it makes no difference whether a man shall see the same things during a hundred years or two hundred or an infinite time. And the second that the longest liver and he who will die soonest lose just the same. For the present is the only thing of which a man can be deprived, if it is true that this is the only thing which he has. A man cannot lose a thing if he does not have it. All experience is formed by thinking. What was said by the cynic Monimus is quite clear, and quite clear too is the usefulness of what was said, if one takes from it what may be got out of it as far as it is true. The soul of man does violence to itself, first of all, when it becomes a separate growth, as it were, a tumour on the universe so far as it can. For to be vexed at anything that happens is a separation of ourselves from nature, in some part of which the natures of all other things are contained. In the next place, the soul does violence to itself when it turns away from any man, or even moves towards him with the intention of injuring him, such as are the souls of those who are angry. In the third place, the soul does violence to itself when it is overpowered by pleasure or by pain. Fourthly, when it plays a part, and does or says anything insincerely and untruly. Fifthly, when it allows any act of its own and any movement to be without an aim, and does anything thoughtlessly and without considering what it is, it being right that even the smallest things be done with reference to an end. And the end of rational animals is to follow the reason and the law of the most ancient city and polity of all, that is, the universe itself. In a human life, the temporal extent of it is a point. The substance of it is a flux or flow, its perception is dull, and the composition of the whole body subject to putrefaction and the mind a whirl. Its fortune is hard to divine, and its fame impossible to judge. In a word, everything that belongs to the body is a stream, and what belongs to the mind is a dream and vapour, and life is a warfare and a stranger's sojourn, and the end of all fame is oblivion. What then may guide a man? One thing and this only, philosophy. But this consists in keeping the guardian spirit within a man free from violence and unharmed, superior to pains and pleasures, doing nothing without purpose, 
nor yet falsely or with hypocrisy, not feeling the need of another man's doing or not doing anything. Moreover, accepting all that happens and all that is allotted as coming from that source, wherever it is, from whence he himself came. And finally, waiting for death with a cheerful mind, as being nothing else than a dissolution of the elements of which every living being is compounded. Now if there is no harm to the elements themselves in the way that each continually changes into another, why should a man have any apprehension about the change and dissolution of all the elements? For it is according to nature, and nothing is evil that is according to nature.